Yeah. Yeah. So my my field is comparative literature, and so the dissertation is across different languages, and it's about poetry. That's everything else that I do is about poetry. Um, so it's about the main kind of philosophical question has to do with the nature of meaning in poetry, and in particular, non-paraphrasable language. Mm -hmm. So, which connects to a lot of different things, musicality, rhythm, um, density, um, but language that is somehow irreducible, or, um, yeah, as I say, non-paraphrasable. Mm -hmm. And so it moves, it moves through a number of poets um, in the 19th and 20th centuries, and it's not about movements, and it's not about, like, it doesn't try to be about the entire work of a given poet, not comprehensive in that way. It really is kind of constellating different poets together in clusters and reading a few of the poems by those poets, and then also prose texts by the poets about poetry. Um, so the first part is about... Um, sort of pieces of symbolism and how that might relate. So it's Mallarmé, Valérie, and Mandelstam, um, and a few poems by each, and prose texts, so like Crise de Verre, for instance, or and then some of Valérie's texts on Mallarmé, and then the Mandelstam text is called Razgavor à Dante, a conversation about Dante. Anyway, then the, the next very big part, very central part, is about Ceylon, and it's um, about the late poetry, so from Fadenzonen and Richtswang and Atemwende before, and the Meridian is very, you know, another, a big prose text. Mm. And then it moves into, there's ta chapters on um, American poet or English language poetry, so there's one on Hopkins and Yeats, mm -hmm. and then um, at the end, it, oh, and there's a bit about Zukovsky, and then at the end it turns into more contemporary poetry. So there are, it's like Susan Howe, John Tagger, but this, that chapter is sort of, it's devoting, I suppose, less time to each person. The other ones are, like the chapter on Ceylon is all Ceylon. The other one is sort of shifting through bits and pieces, but it's more thematic. So, right, so like Susan Howe, John Tagger, Leslie Scalapino and Clark Coolidge. And then there's a little bit about Claude Ray Journeau and a little bit about Andrea Zanzotto. Mm -hmm. And so the, and that chapter is, has to do with, as we were mentioning a little bit earlier, I was saying a little bit earlier about like mathematics in language and emergent properties and crystals, crystal growth, um, as they appear in these different texts in funny ways. So yeah, anyway, that's a rambling. No, 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 it's great in terms of how it positions yourself and how it positions the conversation and I suppose it also has to do with, I mean, it's all related to um, your books and what, I mean, particular, particularly in solar, one finds in solar, you know, um, <clears throat> emergences or, or somehow the emergence of right. some of the themes and the, 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 yeah, the clusters. And, yeah. how, how do you see your um, more critical academic work uh, relating to your creative practice as a poet because obviously the interest in, ma in mathematics uh, okay. feeds into your work or I don't know if your right. work as a poet feeds into your research but how do you see this? It's an interesting question because I think for a while they just felt very separate that you know I was writing poetry from another place, and the critical, the you know, the critical work or the the scholarly work was a different. But I think they there are a lot of convergences that have become kind of clear, and some some folks were asking me about this before whether or not the kind of things that I was thinking about in the dissertation about the kinds of poetry. So you can see some links between someone like Hopkins and Zukovsky or Ceylon, these dense kind of hyper clustering language. J. H. Prynne is another person about whom I care very much and you could see there as well in some way. And they're all very different obviously. Um, and some someone was asking me, like, the kinds of things you're thinking about in your your critical projects, would you apply
apply those ways of thinking, so to speak, to your own work? Or put another way, like, do you see your own work in a lineage of those those people? Those, and I was like, I never really thought about it that way, but yeah, I guess so. Like, and it's not like I'm intentionally trying to write stuff that fits into some idea that I elevate as being like the great poet or something like that or like the important poetry. It's just like I guess that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in, mm. you know. And it, there's another part, another aspect of the dissertation, which I didn't really mention, is that there's a lot of this stuff, as I say, about kind of irreducible language, but then there tries to to suggest the sort of second half of it is trying to suggest that there's a relationship between that kind of language and like non-human alterity. So it talks about like plant life and crystals, as I say, minerals, and like there's a way in which like Hopkins, for example, that very dense language almost has this transubstantiative uh, desire to like puncture into, to I mean make the word flesh, right? So to speak, right. to puncture into a kind of material reality or something. Right. Right. And I guess that's something I'm really interested in in the work. You know, even in the early chapbooks, but certainly in other, in Solar, for instance, there's a heaping up of uh, language where you have, you know, minerals or right. or botany or those right. kinds of lexica. Which that accumulates, yeah, which accumulates on the line, right? Yeah, on the same which line. Cluster, the cluster. And like try to, mm. I don't know, reach at something in mm. almost like a sort of alchemical, I don't know, way. Mm. Not to be like mystical, but you know what I mean? That there's this sort of reaching toward or substance that's being see like sub substantial or matter that I realize I mean partly Ceylon is such an important poet to me I think that's very true for a lot of his work especially the late work and so maybe there was some you know growing out of that or something mm -hmm. adopting adapting that what about Hopkins? Because uh, I, I seem to remember that one of the blurbs uh, of, I think it might have been Birch, yeah. uh, 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 one of the uh, poets likens you to Hopkins and, yeah. say, and she says that you continue the work that Hopkins <laughs> is, has been doing, uh, was doing. And so I was wondering if, yeah. what's your, I mean, you've already started to talk about this, but what is your connection to Hopkins? I love Hopkins. That, that really surprised me. I mean, first of all, I was like, well, you know, that's quite a lot. I mean, thank you. It's, it's really surprised me, um, those kinds of comparisons. But also, I, just the judge of this contest, you know, these contests are all anonymous, so they have no idea who you are when they're doing this, these judging, selection, selecting of the manuscript. She does, didn't know me. And I don't think had read, I mean, I haven't published anything on Hopkins. So this was just like, she observed this. So she is, I guess, very insightful and observant. Like, I think she was referring to these sort of compound words. Like, there are words in, in there, like, um, I'm trying to think of something where it would be, um, well, like in Bert, I know in 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 uh, in Solar, there's yeah. something called silk streaming nucleotides, which uh, you know is all one word. And the reason I remember this one is because Cole had, Rick Swenson had uh, mentioned it and written something about it. But the but in Birch too, there are these sort of like you know violet snow or snow violet or something where it'd be one word. So I think there's that was part of it um, that she was noting that this sort of. Um, Again, this sort of collapsing of of perception and sensation or thing and emotion. But Hopkins, I mean, I guess there's something about about those the poems where there's this sort of hypermetricality and it's so musical, it's so driven by sound. That's something that I I suppose really interests me and I think that in my work there's a lot of sound. Mm -hmm. so someone like Susan Howe, I think mm -hmm. this is very true as well, where I think some people at first glance are like, this is quite chaotic, and how do these things fit together? But if you actually start, you know, immersing yourself, you notice these sonic patterns, these sort of internal rhymes and mirrorings that happen that start making another kind of sense or meaning through sound. So I think that's something that really excites me and interests me about Hopkins. And also just, 
his like obsession with detail and like trying to get to this sort of radical particularity of a substance or so in his journals he has this sort of Ruskin like attention to detail that's just like he'll spend a paragraph trying to get at the particular shade of green of some grass over there you know and he starts using words like chrysoprase like these minerals to tr you know to try to capture the quality of the color so that kind of thing I just I can't help but be drawn to that weird obsessiveness and like I don't know digging in deeper and deeper or something what about his speed I mean because there's an, an, an element of speed in your work as well even in, in I was going to say even all the more in, in, in the very dense um, sound yeah. like passages there's a form of momentum which there, builds yeah. up totally and I was wondering if, if that was something that you shared with Hopkins. That momentum, I think absolutely. I mean, you're carried along in the waves of the syntax and the sound. Um, you know, especially in something like that nature is a Heraclitian fire and of the comfort of the resurrection. Oh, great, <laughs> what a title. Um, where it's very dense and in a way quite fast. I mean, there are these pauses and breaks, obviously, as well. Um, But yeah, I think that's right. And I think sometimes I read quickly. And I think people can follow along. I mean, there are these syntactical um, structures within where you kind of pause. I think sometimes a reader of the text might struggle, I think, finding where those are. But if you kind of follow the logic of the phrases or the clauses, you kind of notice where they would be. Um, and of course, there are line breaks and whatnot. But But I was reading, I, I gave this reading, and I thought, you know, this sort of, the pacing was totally normal. And then, but some, a friend of mine after said, I really wish you would slow down, <laughs> you know. And there are moments that are slow, and there are moments where it's quite quiet, too. Right, but it's right. true that I think sometimes there is that kind of, I don't know. And I think sometimes it, it correlates to certain kinds of emotional intensity, too. Sure. Where you're, you know, there's a sort of, there are moments that are quiet, but then there are other moments where... There's a, I don't know, a, a, an attempt to reach at something, and it's kind of frustrated attempt. And there's, and there are, you know, there are parts in the text about about violence or about loss that, and I think sometimes in that kind of desperate desperate moment or quasi desperation, it sometimes, you know, amps up <laughs> its like temporality or whatever. How do you see the, the um, how do you think about the, the, the line itself, in, in particularly in solar where they keep expanding, there is a sort of elasticity of the line, they expand and then suddenly they retract, or you have passages in prose, yeah. so how do these like somehow combine and um, Yeah. yeah. About yeah. I mean, it's funny. I think right. I mean, there's. What, what, what does it bring to the to, to, to the text? What what do all these like shifts um, yeah. bring to the poem? I think some sometimes it certainly has to do with breath. I mean, the mm. scoring of breath, as mm. has been talked about so much mm. in poetry, or you know, people like Olsen, or certainly again in Hopkins, mm. you have uh, these patterns of skin chin mm. that follow the body in some way. Mandelstam says something fantastic about the meaning of a text being inseparable from the sort of physiological effects that it has. So mm -hmm. things like how much you can say with breath or the heartbeat or, you know, the, what you actually feel, what it does to your body. And I think that's part of it for me in a couple different ways so that when there are the long lines, you're sort of, sort of st stumbling sometimes. But then also visually, mm. so I guess one thing, I, the space of the page is just really important to me. That it, n not that it's a sort of static visual object, like, oh, nice, we could you know, cut this page out. But just that those, that there's something about the perception and also the feeling of it. Like I feel like there's a way in which mm. one feels space that you, when there are just a few bits on a page, you feel that. And it's not necessarily the feeling of silence or something, but it's spacing or something that you you perceive. And so sometimes the stanzas that are short, I mean, there's a way in which it's 
a short, that line ends up being like a short act of perception. But then when there are these sort of square stanzas, I think you can kind of feel it somehow, mm. in, mentally and physically, yes. And for you, do you feel that this um, somehow relation between <coughs> the, the sound, the rhythm that the line creates and the, and the sort of graphic um, design that it creates on the page, is it a way, since you were referring to transubstantiation or <laughs> to making the word flesh, yeah. um, is it a way to create presence um, or a way for the poem to somehow um, um, try to attempt a um, recuperation of presence mm. or, or not at all, or, or just I mean, because it could be because it could be something else altogether, right? Trying, trying right, to right. flee, um, sure. um, you know, the, the, this particular like impossibility of right. creating presence. Of presence. But, yeah. yeah. If I may just interject, interject for one sure. sec second, you know, just following up on what Vincent was saying, you know, in Mud Fractal, uh, there's these lines which are really beautiful. You say the sense of presence to feel you cannot get at that anymore, those modes by and by, except by over ing, which does not work. And I had noted the exact <laughs> same lines, I wanted to quote them, great. That's, so, that's really that's funny, guys are so smart and observant, it's like, hmm, it's like a little chess game. No, I don't, I don't know, I mean, that's, that's very interesting, I don't know if anyone has really like noticed that in that way, that's a, uh, and I don't know if I really would have thought about it like that. Certainly, yeah, that, that line, I mean that part that you're that quotation. I'm trying to sort of understand what I was thinking. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think there was right. There's a fleetingness that I think it's sort of both. I do think it's sort of both, but I think that line is trying to address or reach at or think through something like that. That there's a fleetingness that you can't recuperate. You can't ever quite get there. It's this sort of you're, there's a sort of asymptotic relation. Like you get you can approach it, but you never really get there. And so then there's a mode of excess, right? That's what it says, like by overing, which does not work. So you, you know, it's like I don't know. It's an, I don't know what exactly what this sort of phenomenon is. It's sort of like let's there's a memory. Say you have a sense memory, um, which I think is in there too in these moments say something from childhood like so right. for me the scent of wood smoke is right. always incredibly um, evocative or powerful or transportative um, and I've tried to sort of write that like what is the sense of wood smoke and you just you, I don't know I mean it's incredible again there maybe an asymptotic relationship I don't want to say it's impossible but sometimes I think okay maybe you go a certain distance and then you take something away and by that that subtraction you get there a sort of less is more kind of thing this is also kind of mystical but I think of like Proust or something where there's just like it's trying to get it like what is the, the, the scent of, the memory of the scent of like lilacs or something and obviously it just, you know, keeps up this description. Or the, what is the Hofmannsthal, the letter, what is that letter? But it's similarly trying to remember, like right. to get at senses of things, like a right. bucket of water under a tree or... So I'm not sure, but then to go back to part of what you're asking, Vincent, I think I wonder if those, if those spaces and those stanzas, if how they might be connected. I mean, I, maybe there is an attempt to, to create a presence, or maybe one could think of it as like a space of dwelling. Mm -hmm. So when there are the big spaces, that there can be pause, and maybe somehow in that dwelling and slowing down, if you don't kind of get presence, at least you get some something temporal, some, I guess, dwell, I mean, it's sort of tautological, but you get some kind of... Uh, yeah, but I think, I mean, it's interesting, what, what you're saying is interesting, this, this hovering between two positions, because I, I, I seem to, to have sort of sensed in your writing, I mean, particularly in, in Solar, how, you know, you always refer to, you know, 
um, the matrix, um, circles, grids, the grid, the grid. <laughs> and at the same time, your writing is not particularly grid-like. Right. Um, or in a sense, it's not the grid of the minimalists or the grid of the conceptual, you know, writers. It has nothing to do with Carl Andre's grid, whatever. Right, um, right. You know, things like that. But at the same time, and there's um, on page um, 54, there's a diagram. Right? <laughs> there's this spectacular diagram there, um, which somehow gives another sense of how, you know, an organic. Um, structuration could work. Right. So right. it seems that you you also oscillate between. I mean, is is it what you're trying to do to like oscillate between this densely geometric language and at the same time this organic um, representation of the real that also has to do with, yeah. of course. Um, Geometry. I think so. I think that might be right. I mean, I think there might be a kind of desire toward minim the minimal, mm -hmm. um, if but an inability to do that. You know mm -hmm. that there's, there's like you know, I because I love those grids, mm -hmm. or I love Agnes Martin, or I love Robert Ryman. I mean, there's something that really appeals to me about that kind of clarity or, you know, I don't know, the monochromatic. Whereas this is like so polychromatic, but I don't, yeah. So, but I do think that there, that there's also, as you were saying, that there's this sort of oscillation, and that for me, I guess the, 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 the mathematical or geometrical, at least in part, uh, ends up um, containing or embodying a kind of, a kind of architecture or abstraction. A grid against which all these other things unfold and foliate, and um, so that there, 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 are, there's a moment in uh, Lattice, so another title that you have, like, <laughs> but then of course the poem is kind of crazy. But there's this moment where it lists the Platonic solids. So I, you know, I think it just says like, you know, tetrahedron to cube mm -hmm. to octahedron to dodecahedron to icosahedron. It just lists them. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's not making a pattern that would somehow be them, but it's another moment that's gesturing toward that. Like the Platonic solid, you almost couldn't have a an idea or an object more orderly. You know, these sort of perfect, you know, symmetries mm -hmm. uh, and regularity. And that diagram, which is like mapping uh, constellations and sort of galaxies or galactic objects into octahedra, I mean, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I love, I love the idea. But at the same time, there are these organic, like, shapes um, in, uh, on the diagram. Yeah, like, exactly. Over the diagram, yeah. so there's this strictly geometric, you yeah. know, these, these little blobs, yes, they look like blobs. cells or yes, something, yes, they're organic. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a, a manuscript, Aspen, which um, has been a finalist for a number of contests but has not yet passed through that threshold, that membrane. Um, and Birch is actually an excerpt from this, mm. so it was published separately. Asada did a wonderful job. Um, but it's Aspen is much longer, and there are diagrams in there, and they're often of cellular structures, mm. like of, of trees. So you have an organic thing, but when you look at the molecule structure, I mean, it's the way we the way we represent it anyway is all these hexagons or something. You know, it's an organic but mappable and and symmetric and um, yeah, object. <laughs> What's kind of interesting is is the tension, I mean, the set of tensions, um, you know, between you know, the the geometric and the softer shapes, or between abstraction and the concrete. Um, but also, if you think of a title such as Mud Fractal, uh, on the one hand, you have Fractal, which is the dream of like scientific design clarity, and then the the the, the thickness of it all, the mud, and it, it, it's it's kind of amazing, even in, in the sections where you have um, lists of scientific uh, nouns and names, 
then the real seems to you know get the better of it because through the sheer accumulation of words you know it's as if by dint of adding words even if they're scientific words we're just going back into the waves of <laughs> The, 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 the variety right. of the real the, of, of real the sort of variegation right. of real experience or of the natural yeah I think that's that's definitely right I mean it's funny mud I mean again you kind of hit the nail on the head insofar as mud fractal right that's that's what I was you know I was I guess I was thinking because there are, I mean there's a poem in the in there called Julia set as well which is a, a fractal another fractal and that's, you know, that one is just the name of what it is, and it's not, but in Mud Fractal, it's like, yeah, I mean, how could you have a fractal of mud, right? It's just this, exactly, exactly. And, but somehow that idea seems beautiful to me. Um, you know, we have this expression, clear as mud, you know, right, in, right, in English. Right. So something about that, that there could be order in mud, or what if you could turn mud to glass? Right. Sort of like lead to gold, I guess, but mud to glass. Right. But I mean, the other thing is there are, I mean, I think related to what you're saying, there's a lot of emotion. I mean, mm. even though right. there are, it's pretty out there sometimes, and a lot of language of of, of the scientific or of the, 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 the crystallographic or right. whatever, the mathematical... Um, there's all there's all those other stuff about um, lovers or lost right. or violence against queer people right. or Brother. all, brothers. Brother. Right. You know, it's there's mother. this mother and there's this. Uh, <laughs> right. So there is that. It's all kind of they're kind of shot through with one another or yeah. So anyway, that's all very much in there too in these sort of weird ways. But that's that's kind of an, an, a, another tension. You can have paragraphs or stanzas of um, sound waves, and all of a sudden there's a more personal, I, I shouldn't say more personal, but there's a personal statement emerging. Yeah. And there's this sense of the, the, the voice that emerges, which for which the you know, stage is being prepared by just uh, abstract, almost abstract language. Right. And that I'm quite fascinated by. Just as I'm fascinated by, you know, what you said, uh, I think it's in, it's very early on in, in Solar when you talk about the liar, as in the instrument, in lie, L-Y-E, mm. um, which I looked it up is a caustic used to make soap, right? It's, right, it's, it's a right. chemical element. Right. Um, right. So it's also the idea that the possibility to sing or to uh, be personal, as in lyrical, um, can be emerging out of chemical right. elements. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So I'm yeah. really interested in that tension in your work. You know, be basically renewing lyricism or yeah, thinking. yeah, exactly. I do think yeah, the lyrical or the musical um, or sonic is really important to me, and I kind of I do think yeah, I think that the that it could. I mean, there is this sort of idea like, what if the you know, the the material world could sing. Like, what would that sound be? I mean, it's just sort of the, you know, we hang our harps among, on the willows, you know, um, because they demanded us a, a song kind of moment. I mean, but anyway, but also, I mean, I think Orpheus is, you yeah. know, I, I really like the Orf Orpheus myths and like Rilke's poems on Orpheus or, it's you know it's just an idea, but in particular the idea that the the natural world is like responding to the music that right, right. the trees move, animals, and even the stones move. Which is or, what you say in Necropolis, you know, I want to say sing mass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So right, exactly. So the but the idea that maybe the stones would sing, what that would sound like. I mean, there's something. Oh, for instance, this is maybe only tangentially related, but it came into my mind that there's this aphorism of Lichtenberg, which I really love. Which is because there are also a lot of angels in here, and in in sublimation, there are many orders of the angels. But he has this line: if an angel were to tell us anything, obviously, okay, English, not the German. But if an angel were to tell us something of his philosophy, 
I expect we would hear many sentences like 2 plus 2 equals 13. Um, which I love. I love this idea that sort of maybe, you know, the like language or song of an angelic mind or angelic creature would be somehow like um, hyperspatial or, or um, higher dimensional in some way, right? And that maybe something similar would happen with the natural world. So that's, I guess, a kind of thinking or a kind of that what that reality would be, but then also song. But the liar in lie, which, you know, obviously is, like, again, a sonic moment, a right, sort of internal right. rhyming thing. Yeah, I mean, it's also, yeah, this idea, as you say, it could come out of the kind of the chemical. And also that lie is extremely corrosive. So lie is the extreme end of the base, the basic spectrum. Right. So what if negative seven or, you know, that's right, negative. And so, like, you know, sulfuric acid or, or whatnot is at the other mm -hmm. So lie, you know, that kind of pure would, you know, it's very dangerous. It's right. a very, so right. the idea of, like, if a liar were to go into lie, it would totally dis disintegrate or be yeah. destroyed. So that there's also that there's something dangerous there or something lost or And it's great violent. that it should be one of the poetic principles of your work of taking yeah. taking out letters. <laughs> um, at the beginning taking vowels out right. particularly. Um, and uh, and also repeating letters. Um, I'm sort of struck by the way that your your solar is, you know, peppered with X's. <laughs> everywhere right. and and um, so of course at one point you quote Malame nul yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, and the, the sonnet en X and um, it's it's so I mean it's a, it's a larger question that I wanted to ask on you know about repetition and the way that words recur in your work like characters in a way yeah. Um, there's, so I've, I've already said the matrix, the word faggot, brother, um, terms in X's, of course. So I was wondering whether you thought of, of words as characters in a way, and as, yeah, as you know, um, having a sort of autonomy in a way. Um, yeah, I do. I do think so, I guess. I mean, I think, right, that there's some way of trying to isolate what that would be. But yeah, I think the repetition in a way, it's like, oh, remember that, you know, it's back. <laughs> but it is in a certain way, such as a character might be, it's, it's their turn to appear again or appear on the stage. Um, but then also, I don't know, the light motif, I guess, in some way. So certainly the X's, there, I, you know, I, I can't, you know, yeah, Aphex, you know, Apex, ca Calx, Hex, Hexagon, Sphinx. Onyx, Sphinx, you know, I. I don't even know. Heliotaxis. Movement toward the sun. Yes. Heliotaxis. Yes, of course. Yeah. Syntaxis. Syntax. <laughs> There's a lot of sun also in the book, yeah. obviously. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the. I guess, and I don't even really realize it when I'm doing it, I don't think, to be honest. It's just like a kind of obsessive. But also, I mean, there's an extent to which I, I am realizing, and I do think that. Those sound, there's something about the density of those sounds, of mm -hmm. the sound of the X that I really love and seems like it's puncturing into something, sort of as I was describing before, that desire to kind of condense and change. Um, but then, anyway, this leitmotif idea, it's funny because, so, Zukovsky wrote, writes somewhere, I should know where exactly, but I don't really remember, um, this thing sort of against Eliot, right, where he says he doesn't like these Wagnerian leitmotifs, right, he's sort of, you know, that they're obnoxious or pretentious or maybe politically problematic, um, but I like them <laughs> in a certain sense. Like, I adore Zukovsky, one of my very favorite poets, but I also really love Eliot and in fact, when I was young, The Wasteland was the, the first poem that really, like, moved or hit me. And I read it completely by accident. I think I was 11 or 12, 
and found it in, you know, in a bookstore. I was always in bookstores and finding things, and I was weirdly sort of discovering the modernists by reading the backs of the books, you know, these, these um, kind of like blurbs where they're comparing so-and-so to Pound or Virginia Woolf, where I'm like, who are these people? And then I would go look, and I was like, ah, and totally accidentally, like, accumulating some sense of or desire for modernism and I kind of came across I guess I came across the wasteland in this tiny little kind of beige edition some I think some kind of anniversary edition it's very pretty the sort of cream or vanilla cover thing anyway and I read it I just sat one and read the whole thing I was like this is amazing like I don't know what this is and I of course there are so many things that I didn't understand or was missing all of these so many of the illusions for instance but I don't think that that's a whole other topic about what that means and what meaning would be without those things, that it's still signifying so much or doing so much. But the musicality, or too, or those repetitions, and they are actually characters in the way. So, so I think that's something that I really, this is all a long rambling way to say that, I think that, that that's something that I'm interested in about creating for yourself, for the poem itself, in a way, its own like internal life and for the reader these patterns that recur over time that are like leading you through mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I like that I love mm -hmm. echoes mm -hmm. and I love the idea of being brought through a kind of architecture mm -hmm. through repetition mm -hmm. what about the uh, repetition of ifs there are moments in the book where you uh, have a series of ifs um, from very early on, like page four, or later on uh, in the Julia, Julia set, um, and it, it just the, the way you use um, those if hypotheses uh, reminded me of uh, a section of uh, Peter Giz's "Some Values of Landscape and Weather," where he he uses if clauses to actually. Uh, Go lyrical, and I was I was really interested in in, in in your use of ifs, which I also read as more like scientific hypotheses, oh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or even Wittgensteinian, yeah, because because it's deeply at the beginning it's deeply connected to the two Wittgenstein quotes yeah. of the um, Tractatus, the yeah. quotes from the Tractatus. Well, yeah. the, 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 they're not entire quotes though, right? But, they're, um, yeah. So so I I, I I I sort of read them. I read those ifs as logical structures. I'm trying to yeah as trying to create illogical logical structures. Yeah. Or, Opening the possibilities of that the poem would create. Yeah, um, I think definitely. You know. I mean, I think that if there's a way in which, yeah, there's the if-then mm. structure, yep. um, that there is this sort of logical or quasi-logical structure, and then also this idea of just sort of opening a hypothetical or something, opening a question or you know, not answering something but opening mm. and. And then you know, sometimes there, as you say, there, as you say, Olivier, they're, they're sometimes in a row. There's no then, like there's no mm -hmm. answer, but it's sort of if this or if this or, um, and I don't know. I guess it's sort of searching for something mm -hmm. in a way, or trying to open up different thoughts or experiences without concluding. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Definitely, the Wittgenstein too mm -hmm. um, was really important to me. Uh, in, in my more academic or philosophical work, because I mean, I, I studied philosophy. I mean, I studied. I actually did do math and physics at some point earlier in my life. So that's partly why this stuff is in there, which I suppose is worth <laughs> noting. But there was also a period of philosophy, and the MPhil that I did at Cambridge was philosophy st stuff. Um, so I, I really love Wittgenstein. But um, I was going to say, I have this this work, this manuscript that is is almost finished. I, I'm thinking Fence might publish it. Um, but it's, it's called Tesseract. So yeah, again, more you know, a hypercube, more. Mm. Uh, but there are a lot of these moments where it says that would be, and then something you know, mm. that would be, an you know, an elm over water and an mm. emerald or something like that. That would be, and it kept keeps saying this, and I was like, what am I doing? You know, there's this moment, but I think it's a similar idea of sort of gesturing to something syntactical, some kind of answer or proposition, but doesn't really conclude. Right. 
Yeah. And with the, that would be also, there's this um, Philip Glass in Einstein on the Beach, this um, the Mr. Bojangles yes. song. And there are these moments where he's like, that would be, I don't know, it's a totally broken mm. language. It's mm. beautiful, but kind of childlike. It's like, that would be mm. America. Mm. <laughs> you know, like, that would be a blue ball rolling down the hill. I don't know. But it's mm. more, very repetitive and more broken. But there's something about that. Could, could you speak more thing. more about um, Wittgenstein? Because it seems to me, I mean, you quote, so it's the first Wit Wit Wittgenstein as yeah. opposed to the, the, the later Wittgenstein. But it seems to me that your book is more the later Wittgenstein than the first Wittgenstein. So, so could you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I funny, it's funny. I wonder if there's a sort of relation to the question of the abstraction the desire for a kind of the grid or the graph or the abstraction or something like that as a background overarching against which the particularity stuff unfolds or in contrast to which because I think that's right. I mean the quotes are from the track the Tractatus, mm -hmm. um, because I do love the book and I love those the quote the lily the lilies in the story, the you know, the you know, the the boys which is kind of a sort of has a connotation of being like homoerotic or something, these boys and the lilies. But so I just think that that's beautiful, especially considering like Wittgenstein's <laughs> biography. <laughs> um, but, um, but I guess, but yeah, I feel, I guess, particularly invested in the, in, in the investigations. And in the, I think there's also a moment in Cumulus in, in um, Solar where it just says, you know, remarks on color, mm -hmm. remarks on the foundations of mathematics. Yeah. It, it just mentions these titles, but it's... So a lot of that late stuff I, yeah. is very important. A lot of the books that aren't quite studied as, or studied quite as much. Mm -hmm. But um, but I guess the thing about, the thing that comes to mind t in your question is this, to me, is what there's a moment where in, I guess it's in the investigations, he says something referring back to the Tractatus, saying something like, I wanted to create a world of ice, or I think, or I was trying something like this, mm. or, you know, or, yeah, I want, I tried to, or something like this, or I, I ended up creating a world of ice. Mm. But the idea is that, that, but that there was no, but then there was no friction, there was nothing to hold on to. Like I ended up creating a world that you couldn't, you couldn't touch or couldn't, and obviously the investigations instead is so the, in the Tractatus there's a, there's a creating of a logic. What is the world? How do we define kind of sets of what reality? And then, then in the investigations there's this in, you know you you investigate um, how we actually use our language and in particular cases and language games what this means when we have these kind of interactions. And, and, and then pursuing, you know, philosophical misconstruals where you're saying, oh, well, these words or philosophical terms you're using are being used in this sort of like um, an unsecure, erroneous way, and that's where the problem lies. So we kind of keep unfolding the, the sort of the artichoke or whatever and get it's more, anything. more related to experience. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the word yeah. even comes into Yeah, his, exactly. You know, and you're like digging into yes. particular examples and particular kinds of language use or exchanges, whereas the other one is cre trying mm. to create this mm. sort of um, more perfect or pure architecture, abstract abstraction. Um, yeah, and there's a, another moment too, like I think in the investigations where he says, um, some, again sort of referring to the Tractatus, like we're trying to touch the world or mm. something, reach the world, mm. um, but we were only tracing the frame, mm. we're like looking, that you're looking through. Yes. So you kind of tra keep tracing the frame, but you're not actually... But that's wonderful, right? Because, I mean, if we refer, if we go back to the grids, right? Yes. I mean, my sense is exactly that, that your your book is, you know, speaks a lot about the first Wittgenstein, but is the second Wittgenstein, <laughs> right, in fact, right, right? right? Because it, it it's the way that experiential, you know, sort of knowledge or experience or whatever, um, sort of seeps in and, and relates to other more geometrical or scientific motifs that allow us to somehow 
um, frame the reel. Um, yeah. So, so I feel that there are these uh, configurations, in fact, um, in, in, in this work that that's truly. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. That's but no. That seems really, really um, accurate in many ways. That it's. Right, that there's almost a desire to get at mm. that the, the sort of early mm. Wittgensteinian idea. Again, it's sort of asymptotic, but you can't help but go through the the sort of vegetation, you know, the, mm. that is the world. You, mm. you know, you you have to go through all of this, the brackish water or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And... and um, Taking another, another road, yeah. but, but fully related, um, you refer to activism, and of mm. course it's even in your bio, you know you're an activist. Uh, so, so what does it mean in terms of writing poetry? Um, um, I feel that sublimation, for instance, is more overtly yeah. um, um, somehow, I don't know whether it's activist, yeah. but, 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 but the... the, the Terms related to you know uh, queerness um, or gayness, um, yeah. sex um, emerge more than in solar. Right. So so what what in, I mean is your activism? Of course, it's related to your writing, but how much does the writing play a part in the activism? Yeah, I mean I think the. It's important to me, I guess a lot of it is sort of LGBTQ or queer active. Like there's other stuff in there about class and about, you know, other political axes or dimensions that are part of, you know, our identities or struggle or reality um, everywhere um, and certainly in the US, you know, uh, right now, I guess. But, um, and in Solar, the sort of some of the queer or the the sex stuff is there, but then it kind of comes and goes. And ought to be totally candid, there was more of that, and I kind of cut it out a little bit, because even though I cared about it, it just seemed like too much. Like it seemed, I don't know, like, no, of course, unsavory. But, no, but I will get to your to the no, no, the real the question no, but, about the. But that's that's interesting. Yeah, though. I don't I mean, know. In what, terms of activism, it's interesting that you're taking out because it's too much. Yeah, it's I know, and I don't. I mean, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I I just it's see. I guess the thing is, ultimately, the I, I didn't do that for. I don't think reasons of, of, of embarrassment or shame or feeling like it was inappropriate. It was more like aesthetic reasons mm. in some way, whereas like these words are hitting the wrong notes, like the tone is wrong. Even though I would like to have a particular like sex act or something in here, the way I just said it, it just, it rings wrong because it's it, because of the way, you know, not always, it's very context dependent, but you know what I mean? That the, mm. you're like this, it's, it's too jarring. It doesn't fit the other, the tonal mm. landscape, sort of, so to speak, mm. that I'm trying to create, like almost mm. like a painting. It's like if you're creating a painting of like blues and then you have this like orange stripe or something mm. like that, which obviously, is, again, sometimes in context, that's what you want, but sometimes, mm. so I think that's part of the elimination was for aesthetic reasons. Mm. So like to go to the question though, I think that the, the Queer stuff is just really important for me to have it in there and to like have that friction and that um, the splinterings of you know, desire and sometimes violence. Um, in in Mud Fracto, there's a moment sort of about like protests and mm -hmm. like it says something about like um, um, like something like rain oil rainbow tiles and something like the um, tear gas mm -hmm. uh, you know clouding their their eyes um, holding an intersection is this there's this moment so that's a thing where you're actually having a precise part where the kind of moment or, or birch also has these moments mm. about actually like a couple who are beat up mm. you yeah. know because just yeah. because they're holding hands yeah. or they try to leave so there are these moments where it's addressing like homophobia or whatnot it's in fact especially in birch there are these moments of, right. of uh of this sort of intimacy and sort of gentleness that keeps getting kind of attacked or broken from outside. So there's there's that about this sort of like content, you know, that I want to be there. 
Again, this is like a long, all my answers are really long and rambling. Um, but the other thing, I do, I do think in a more abstract way, and I don't know, I just like happen to think this is sort of true. Well, two things, one a little simpler and one a little more simple. The simpler one is I do think that poetry has this intrinsic political like reality or dimension or potentiality. I think on a, on one way, it just, it just mind opening. I mean, in this sort of way, it's like it, it, it makes you slow down. You have to spend more time with the particularity of words and perceptions to think through them, to sort of feel them. And I think that there's an inherent value in that kind of work that it's, you know, in the sort of 60s language, like consciousness expanding. I mean, it is making you think and open and dwell your experience that has a real value. For, for ethical reasons, for how you then then go back and are with other people, I think that that dwelling at, or that kind of um, slowing of relational attention, real attention or the care, I do think in a way reflects or refracts back to human relation. So I do think that there's this inherent kind of, not to, to make it instrumental, um, but that there is this inherent you know, ethical aspect to what happens via poetry. So, and then on the second part, I mean, and this is just more abstract, but just, I, I guess, there's a big part of me that really, like, likes or agrees with Adorno. And I do think there's another way in which just writing or poetry or art, you know, has this other kind of more abstract political dimension or utility insofar as it kind of, it resists a kind of appropriation or... I do think that there's something, that's a almost more metaphysical <laughs> kind of argument, but I do think that that's kind of true, mm -hmm. that there's a way in which it, in, it's the way it moves through human life, it kind of disrupts mm -hmm. uh, other kinds of, you know, reification or just leveling of experience. So.